This is the Group 5 presentation for Love Song Analysis. Group 5 consists of William Sprout, Jennifer Lindbergh, and Paul Ludwig. Our group wanted to see what inspires the writers of love songs. Our group thought long and hard about what we wanted to discover about the love songs we were going to examine. We decided that attempting to discover the muse that inspired the love songs in the first place would be an interesting and worthwhile goal. Before we could discover what motivated the love song's creation, we needed to clearly define what a love song would be. Then, after we decided what a love song was defined as, we needed to figure out what love songs we would examine. This was a longer process because we wanted to examine love songs that would reflect the opinions of a great number of people. We decided that examining only popular love songs would be the best route. We also wanted to see what love songs were really about. That is, we knew we would examine love songs, but would love songs only be about lust and physical love? Or would they be about other types of love as well? Also, would different times have different opinions about love songs? And would the sex of the love song singer or the love song writer make for a different love song? We began our research about what inspired the love songs with these questions in mind. Our sampling strategy was partially based upon our idea of seeking what inspired the love song writer or the singer and partially based upon our research questions about the love songs themselves. Fortunately, we were able to use convenient sampling to meet our needs. Convenient sampling would allow us to answer our question about the different types of love songs, that is, were they agape, philos, or eros love songs. Convenient sampling would also allow us to see if love songs have changed over time, and it would allow us to see whether or not the writers were male or female. We looked at the best-selling songs from the past 75 years, and we looked at the number of songs sold, not the amount of dollars made. In that way, we really look, only looked at what was immensely popular with people. One caveat is that we looked at Billboard's records, so our scope was limited to Occidental culture and perspective. Yet despite this, we felt that Billboard's records gave us immediate and useful insight and helped us answer our research questions. We were able to see what songs whether Eros, Agape, or Philos sold best, and we were able to see whether the singer or writer was male or female. Additionally, the fact that people responded to these songs by buying them in the millions also suggested that these songs resonated with a large group. And because of that, if we could discover what the muse was for these songs, we would have a fairly good insight into what motivated love songs writers, since the song obviously gained empathy for so many people. We discovered that the top 20 songs on the Billboard chart reflected primarily Eros love songs. Interestingly, however, the th top three best-selling songs of all time were not Eros love songs at all. Out of the top 20, 10 were Eros love songs, 4 were Agape songs, 2 were Philos love songs, and 4 were not love songs at all. At this point, we narrowed our focus onto the top 8 Eros love songs and began searching for the lyrics to our songs. With our top eight songs narrowed down, and our song lyrics found and identified, we began the fun part of individually coding our love songs. Here are our love songs. There are two male group songs, 
three male solo singer songs and three female solo singer songs. Interestingly, the top love songs are primarily sung by males. We then developed our procedure with the final presentation in mind. The confirmability matrix is one that we set up based on um, other examples that we have seen in the literature. Um, we decided to rate the songs based on certain aspects and categories that we felt went together. Um, for example, romantic love, physical love, decision making, pleading, timing, proximity. Those are just to name a few. Um, we then decided to score them based on the number of times that they were um, used throughout the, um, the current song and what they meant as far as what the author meant when they spoke them or wrote or, or had written them um, during that time. Um, from there, we uh, completely added them all up, um, again, based on the literature that we had um, read about the confirmability matrix, and then created this um, <coughs> completed project for our, um, our research questions and how to ensure that we were um, doing it correctly. So that's basically the uh, gist of what we did with the confirmability matrix. It was, uh, to me, most, one of the most difficult pieces of the uh, research project due to the fact that there are so many examples of it and so many ways to do it. Um, it was hard to know which one we were going to get correctly um, marked as far as uh, to ensure that we had uh, credibility in our study. Our analysis of the confirmability matrix was based on our research questions. To review, our research questions stated, do love songs mostly reflect agape, philos, or eros love? Have these views in love changed over time as reflected in popular music? And what is the prompt predominant view of the male or female writers? The three types of love we considered in our analysis were, were agape love, which is considered unconditional love, philos love, which is love found through bonding together with friends, family, and in a marriage, and eros love, which is uh, where the term erotica comes from and is basically sexual love. We had already discovered earlier in our research that the best-selling love songs of all time were primarily Eros love songs. But would the expression of love within these overall Eros love songs be more Phyllis, Agape, or Eros? Of course, love songs over time tended to be er more Eros than any other, but there were expressions of all types of love in these eight songs that we examined. Physical love is ever-present and does not seem to change. The wants and needs associated with Eros love are present in all the songs we examined. As many of the songwriters were not always the performers, it is difficult to say with certainty what the predominant view of love is according to male or female songwriters. Despite our not being able to say with certainty what the predominant view of love is by male and female love song writers, what our coding seemed to indicate about the differences between males and females was this. Songs from earlier years in the Billboard charts that were love songs about physical love were performed by male artists. Songs in later years that described physical desire were performed by female artists. This may reflect Occidental society's acceptance of female expression. Additionally, it seemed that the songs performed by males had a higher number of words that were pleading. That is, male-sung songs were more about seduction. 
This is not to suggest that female songs had less suggestions of sex, but only that men to seemed, men's songs seemed to plead more for it. For the most part, we achieved agreement on what lines from the songs meant. However, when we had some disagreement on some of the lines from some of the so various songs, generally we looked at it where if two of us agreed with what the line meant, we went with that idea. And this concludes the Group 5 presentation analysis of love songs.